Good evening. Welcome to the Lincoln Land Conservation Trust's annual meeting. I'm Jeff McGeehan, the Executive Director, and it's wonderful to see so many of you here this evening in person. Yay. First, first time, I think, since 2019. So I want to thank uh, St. Anne's in the Fields Church for allowing us to use their beautiful space here tonight. Um, and I also want to thank our very talented musicians, uh, Maggie and Liesel. <laughs> so impressive. So that was a really nice uh, reception. So special thanks to them. Um, so tonight we have three parts to our annual meeting. Uh, part one will be a brief business meeting that will include the election of our trustees. Uh, then we'll provide a quick summary of some of the land trust activities uh, over the last year plus. And then finally, we're excited to welcome our guest speaker, uh, the land trust's very own Gwen Loud. And I know many of you came here tonight to see and hear Gwen, uh, so we'll try to get to that highlight very soon. Um, so we'd like to keep things very informal tonight. So if you have any questions or comments, um, you can type them into the chat box. Oh, no, you don't have to do that. You, you can just raise your hand. So um, before we move to the business meeting, I just want to thank everyone again who supports the Land Trust and, of course, also encourage you to get involved. Uh, a great part of the success of the Land Trust uh, through the years is thanks to the dedication of its members and supporters. Uh, there are many ways you can help support the Land Trust, um, and I want to just touch on a couple of those right now. Of course, number one is membership. Uh, we could not do our conservation work without your generosity. Uh, the financial support provided by your membership helps fund the vast majority of LLCT's annual operating budget. So again, to all our members, thank you. Uh, next month, you'll be receiving a membership reminder for 2024, uh, either in snail mail or email. And so we hope you'll consider supporting the Land Trust again this coming year. So this is just to remind us how beautiful Lincoln really is. Um, and the reason it looks this way is because of your support for conservation through the years. I also want to take an opportunity to thank all the talented photographers who submit photos to us throughout the year, and more specifically for the Lincoln Open Spaces calendar. Many of you saw some of those wonderful photos that were highlighted on the screen uh, before we started this evening. We have so many special places in town and incredible biodiversity that our talented photographers are able to capture. The 2024 Open Spaces calendar will be available very soon, so please keep your eyes open for that. I do want to mention another way you can help support the Land Trust, actually coming right up in a couple of weeks, uh, is through the Scarecrow Classic. Uh, we're up to our 11th annual of this fun community event, so if you're a runner or a walker, I hope you can join us on Sunday morning, October 15th. Uh, you can find more information and the link to the registration on our website, lincolnconservation.org. And I do want to thank all those who have supported the event through the years by running, walking, or volunteering. And particularly want to thank our very loyal and generous business sponsors. So again, please put October 15th on your calendar. And you know I say this every year. So far, we're 10 for 10. The weather is always glorious. Uh, I say that with slightly less confidence this year, given our weekend uh, weather, but um, I'll do my best. So October 15th. And uh, please register soon, especially if you're interested in one of our famous Scarecrow shirts. Okay, on to our business meeting. As I mentioned, your support through membership is critical to the Land Trust's success through the year. One of the tasks that our membership is asked to perform is the election of our trustees. Our nominating committee has put forth six existing trustees this year who are seeking election for three-year terms to the LCT board. All of these trustees are currently serving and their terms are expiring. Those trustees are Andy Nazzo, our vice treasurer, Ken Bassett, Dan England, Jim Henderson, Susan Welsh, and Andy Stevenson. So I'd like to make uh, request a motion uh, from our membership to accept the proposed slate and re-elect the six trustees. So could someone make a simple motion to approve the slate? So moved. So moved. Excellent. May I have a second? A second. Great. Uh, okay, if you're a member, uh, you can all raise your hand in support. Great. Any opposed? Okay, good. 
All right, motion passes, and the six trustees will serve three-year terms expiring in 2026. Thank you for that. Uh, I do want to take a moment now to acknowledge the other LLC trustees who serve the board so well and whose terms are not up this year. And those trustees are Susan Allen, our vice chair, Buzz Constable, LLCT's president, Andy Fallander, Tony Howland, Gwyn Loud, Diana Zhang, Bob Mason, Ellen Metters, our treasurer, Nancy Sulet, our secretary, and certainly last but not least, uh, Michelle Barnes, our chair. I should also mention that all of the trustees also serve on the Rural Land, Land Foundation Board, uh, so they have double duty with LLCT and RLF. So please thank them for all their efforts in helping to conserve and steward the fields, woods, and trails for us all to enjoy. So before we introduce our guest speaker, I'll keep you waiting just a little longer, um, we wanted to provide a brief summary of the land trust activities over the last year plus. Uh, stewardship of our conservation lands is one of the most important responsibilities for the land trust. Working with the Conservation Commission and their staff, we help manage and oversee more than 3,000 acres of land and over 80 miles of interconnected trails. It's obviously a big job, but LLCT is very fortunate to have an outstanding stewardship director, Sarah Lupkus, who oversees our stewardship responsibilities. Sarah is going to give us a quick summary of some of those many activities that she, our stewardship committee, and many dedicated volunteers are involved with out on the land. Thank you, Jeff. I feel very fortunate to be the stewardship director in Lincoln, not only do I get to work outdoors in our beautiful conservation land, but I also collaborate with the best people. There are many overlaps in these categories, but working with our staff, landowners, LLCT members, volunteers, our trustees, and the conservation department makes my job a pleasure to do every day. Um, first, I would like to thank Jeff and Bryn, and also wish a fond farewell to Joe Miller, who until recently was our stewardship coordinator. He's moved to Sudbury's Conservation Department, but is now a resident of Lincoln and still an active volunteer. Another group that I would like to thank um, is the Stewardship Committee, which is a subcommittee of our Board of Trustees and includes Buzz Constable, Paul Shore, Michelle Barnes, and Ellen Metters. They provide valuable guidance, information, and historic perspective, which I find essential in helping me fulfill my responsibilities to steward the land and defend against any encroachments that we might find ourselves dealing with. I would also like to thank all of our volunteers. Working to combat invasive plants is an important task in trying to maintain the resiliency and conservation values of our protected land. It takes a village, and we're always happy to have more volunteers join us. We have many different options, so please email me if you're interested, and I can help connect you with the right opportunities. Importantly, all of the collaborations that I've mentioned wouldn't be possible without our friends in the conservation department. Michelle, Stacy, Ryan, and Will, and the Conservation Commission are such a great team, and without their support, the monitoring, trail work, and volunteer workdays wouldn't be as effective or enjoyable. Monitoring conservation restrictions is really one of the most important duties we have as a land trust. Our generous landowners who have donated conservation restrictions are one reason Lincoln can proudly claim so much conservation land. We also have trail easements, which help so much with connectivity and have been generously donated by landowners as well. Annual monitoring gives us the opportunity to get out on the land and see how different areas and owners are maintaining the conservation values. We always send letters out before we start monitoring for the year. And if you have a conservation restriction and would like to join me when I monitor, you can send me an email and we'll schedule a time that's mutually convenient. In 2022, we continued working to implement our pollinator action plan. This is a marathon, not a sprint, and included a second prescribed burn at Chapman Pasture. And you can see Jim Henderson on his tractor helping us seed an area of Chapman with the wildflower mix. Jim's help has been pivotal at Chapman, and we're very grateful for the time he's taken to troubleshoot with us and help us with the seed sowing. We also constructed a pavilion at the People for Pollinators Meadow, which now provides a pleasantly shaded place to sit and includes gutters that feed into rain barrels, as well as a solar-powered pump so we can use a hose from those barrels. We've hosted more events at the Meadow now that we have such a nice structure, and we owe a huge thanks to Jane Leighton, our former stewardship coordinator, for her role in facilitating the design and construction of the pavilion. 
I also want to thank all of the volunteers who have been involved with our pollinator work and have helped us with planting, watering, and weeding throughout the growing seasons. And one of our most dedicated volunteers um, and one of the most vital reasons we work so hard to improve the habitat in Lincoln is for wildlife, particularly native wildlife. Birds can be an indicator of ecosystem resilience, and Patty Cable is one of our most diligent volunteers here, monitoring 10 of our nesting boxes around town to track the nesting habits and successes of bluebirds and tree swallows. This past season, Patty monitored twice a week from mid-April through mid-August, noting 64 target species eggs and 48 fledglings, a 75% success rate and an increase from 34 fledglings the previous year. Thank you so much, Patty, and I would like to thank all of you here for your help in stewarding this land. So thank you, Sarah, for all your great work in helping to lead the stewardship program. And of course, speaking of thank yous, uh, I need to thank our other very dedicated staff member, uh, Bryn Gingrich, who many of you know leads our outreach and education activities. She'd be up here speaking, but one of her many hats that she wears is our technology and logistics wizard. And we didn't want to risk taking her off that job tonight. So she's sitting right here overseeing it all. So uh, Bryn does an amazing job with LLCT's outreach. And among her many talents, she produces our weekly email blasts that most of you hopefully receive. And if you don't, uh, you're missing out. So um, please see her and sign up for it. Of course, she works with our equally fantastic outreach committee, uh, consisting of Gwen Loud, uh, Diana Jong, and Diana Rice, all beautifully pictured up there. And together, they're responsible for all of the land trust's exciting educational activities uh, over the year. So a special thanks to them, and I want to take a couple minutes to touch on a few of those outreach activities. So one of the Land Trust's most important goals is to help connect people to nature. Not only does nature provide important health benefits, but the more connected we are, the more educated we become on the importance of supporting conservation at the local, national, and even global level. Throughout this past year, uh, the LCT sponsored nature walks throughout our amazing trail system, continued our annual birding identification series led by several of our local birding experts. Uh, special thanks to them, uh, Corey Nimmer, Nancy Soulette, Ron McAdow, Norm Levy, Michelle Grisenda, and of course, Gwen Loud. Uh, we also conducted our very popular annual vernal pool exploration with Matt Byrne, former conservation director for the Walden Woods Project. And then last year, we were able to bring a live animal program into the Lincoln Public Schools. And we had Rick Roth from Snakes of New England come into an after-school program that included the Leap Kids. Um, you can't tell from the slide, but it was total chaos. <laughs> and despite all the screaming, um, the snakes hung in there, and the kids had a really good experience with some pretty cool reptiles. So as Sarah mentioned, the Pollinator Action Plan continues to be an important priority uh, for the Land Trust. And over the last four years, uh, we've distributed nearly 10,000 native plants within Lincoln and surrounding towns. Throughout the year, the Land Trust continues to provide educational opportunities to remind people of the importance of planting native species to restore our local ecosystems, many of which have been overrun with invasives. Another one of the Land Trust's ongoing priorities is to extend our collaborations with other organizations, both within and outside of Lincoln. Collaborations provide for sharing of ideas and enrich our educational opportunities and experiences for both our members and supporters. You can see up on the screen some of the many collaborations we had over the last year, including collaborations with the Burgess School and the Lincoln Public School. And one of our most far-reaching collaborations over the last few years has been our On Belonging series. On Belonging in Outdoor Spaces is a speaker series on access, inclusion, and connection in nature. This free virtual event has been hosted by the LLCT, Farrington Nature Link, 
the trustees through the Decor of a Sculpture Park and Museum, the Food Project, Mass Audubon, and the Walden Woods Project. Additional support has been generously provided by the Ogden Codman Trust, the Lincoln Garden Club, Lincoln Cultural Council, Sudbury Foundation, Freedom's Way, and the Bemis Free Lecture Series. So it's quite a collaboration. Hopefully many of you have tuned into the, some of these talks um, as, as we've had many inspiring speakers, but if you've not had a chance, uh, the recordings of the presentations are available on the website at onbelongingoutdoors.org. So another one of the focuses this past year has been uh, to start educating all of us about the importance of dark skies. This actually started a couple years ago with a presentation by James Lowenthal, a professor of astronomy at Smith College. Uh, he educated us on the impacts of light pollution, not only on wildlife, but on our own human health. Uh, professor Lowenthal has been able to document the exponential growth of light pollution, even within Lincoln, in the last 10 to 15 years. Also, many of you hopefully attended our Zoom annual meeting last year when Avalon Owens gave a fascinating talk on her research with our local firefly species and the importance of turning off our lighting at nighttime. The negative impact of light pollution on fireflies and other nocturnal species is significant. Over the coming year, the Land Trust is hoping to expand its outreach efforts with Lincoln residents, organizations, and town officials on the importance of dark skies and limiting nighttime lighting. So if you're interested in getting involved or have ideas, please let us know. Now that's the goal of our dark sky initiative. Kind of wants, makes you want to close your eyes, but not yet. So the Land Trust Board believes that climate change is the greatest environmental crisis of our time, impacting our local conservation lands as well as the rest of the world. Both the LLCT and RLF aim to do what they can to respond in helpful ways, consistent with being a Lincoln-focused organization. As part of the policy you can see up on the screen, LLCT and RLF are committed to using acquisition and stewardship strategies aimed at mitigating climate change, providing educational opportunities regarding climate change, including constructive actions that we all can take, and reducing our own carbon footprint, including from the operations at the mall at Lincoln Station. And finally, hopefully many of you heard Doug Tallamy speak to the critical importance of preserving biodiversity to help mitigate climate change. Uh, the Land Trust sent out a climate change and biodiversity brochure this past year to remind you of some of the simple seasonal things we can all do in our backyards to make a difference. Um, if it's not up on your fridge or you have not memorized it, uh, you can find it on our website. Um, and I think we have a few more on the Land Trust table that you can grab on your way out. So Lincoln looks the way it does today with beautiful fields, forests, wetlands, and trails because of the generosity of so many who have contributed to the land conservation efforts through the years. Your support for land acquisition is critical, and of course, the, at the local level, is one of the best ways we can mitigate climate change. While we did not complete any acquisition projects this past year, we do have a few in the pipeline that we hope will be coming forward this coming year, so stay tuned. We continue to be very active in looking for opportunities to protect properties that have been identified as lands of conservation interest on the town's open space and recreation plan. Just in the ta last 20 plus years, we've helped protect nearly 1,000 acres of additional land. And now, thanks to the amazing talent of Bryn Gingrich, outreach director by day and drone operator by night, actually also by day, um, you're about to enjoy a bird's eye view of just some of the many special conservation places we have here in Lincoln.
so thank you again to Bryn, and uh, also a special thanks to Larry Unger for writing and recording the beautiful music for the video. And I think Larry is here in the audience tonight. Uh, there he is in the back row. Okay, so hopefully that got us warmed up for the evening. Uh, and now we get to the highlight. So it's um, humbling to introduce our guest speaker tonight, although she's not really a guest since she's been in town for over 55 years and on the land trust for over 40 years. But who's counting? I was trying to think of one word that would describe Gwyn Loud, and it was not easy, but I came with, up with one that I think is appropriate, inspirational. Gwyn is inspiring with her incredible knowledge of Lincoln's flora and fauna, which she's gonna tell us about this evening. Of course, most of you know that she's been writing an informative, entertaining, and inspiring wildlife column for the last 15 years after taking over for Sue Clem and her great work. Gwyn is inspiring with all the amazing places she travels. Perhaps she'll work that into the talk tonight. She's inspiring in her dedicated work as a teacher and educator for so many years at the Ten Acre School in Wellesley, Drumlin Farm, and even our own Lincoln Public Schools. She's inspiring with her unique ability to make the croaking sounds of all our local frog and toad species. She's inspiring in her unprecedented running ability. I can't remember her running streak, but not that long ago, she had a streak well up into the many hundreds of consecutive days of running. Puts us all to shame. Not recently. <laughs> I know she was inspiring to Rob, and of course she inspires her wonderful daughters. She's inspiring with her warm soul and her bright smile. And finally, I think she inspires us all to be better because at the core, she's just a really good person. So please welcome Gwyn Loud for our inspiring talk this evening. Thank you for coming tonight. It's wonderful to see so many friendly faces. I also want to thank anybody in the room who has ever um, talked to me at Donnellan's or sent me an email or given me a phone call about a sighting, um, maybe to be included in my um, wildlife column or sent me a photo, or anyone who has um, been, in, we've been in touch um, over the past couple months about my topic tonight. Um, could you raise your hand if any of you have done that? Thank you very much, and keep those keep keep it coming, because you know we're all here really because we care about nature. We love nature, so send me your sightings for my columns. Um, I also want to give a special shout out to Bryn, who has put together this slideshow. We've done a lot of back and forth about it, and it's good because of her. Um, this photograph, in case you're wondering, is not taken in Lincoln. It's, um, it was taken on a birding trip to Newfoundland in 2019, and those birds behind me are gannets, and that's a huge breeding gallant, gannet colony. All right, um, on with the topic of tonight. It's way too big a topic. I mean, this could easily be a college course. So I, you don't mind staying till 11, right? I have worked hard. I'll talk fast. I've tried to keep it not too long. Big stress on the word change. Change has been ongoing. We'll, be, we'll have change in our natural world constantly. And going back to the time life began on the planet. Don't worry, I'm not starting there tonight. Um, and please remember those two words, biodiversity and healthy ecosystems. Well, that's three words. But um, you know, those, those are central concepts to keep in our minds as we think about preserving our, na our natural world. Um, and although I'm going to be talking about individual species tonight, 
And there's always a lot of um, focus in the press about, say, saving endangered species. Every single species, whether you're talking about a cricket or you're talking about an eagle, they're all part of e whole ecosystems and fit somewhere in food chains. Um, I do want to um, make a disclaimer. I am not a, a trained biologist. I am um, I'm an amateur um, naturalist, and I've been looking at nature ever since I was a kid, but I, I have to turn to um, all sorts of experts to, to learn from them. And as a former teacher and presenter of many workshops over the years, I know that the first time you give a class or a workshop is never the best. You go home and you think, oh, I should have said that, I shouldn't have said that, and the second and third are best. Well, bad luck for you, because you are the guinea pigs tonight. <laughs> and so this is the only time I think I will ever be giving this talk. Um, most of what I am talking about tonight is anecdotal. We do not have much in the way of hard data about our flora and fauna. Um, we have, say, the Christmas bird count, um, things like that. But a lot of it's anecdotal. But that's, that's OK. So be it. You know, if 10 people say to me, I never hear pheasants anymore, we'll go with it, right? So that's a lot of what you will hear tonight. Um, Concord has better, better actual data, going back, say, to the journals of Thoreau and other journalists in, in Concord, keeping all kinds of records. Um, some of our trends in Lincoln are regional, so I think it's OK to mention some of this as well. Um, I, Reread Sue Clem's book, The Nature of Lincoln, which was published in 2012. It's still available if you would like it. Thank you, Sue. Um, well, just before we, we talk about what's on the screen, I'm very pleased to say that last week, Governor Maura Healey was the first governor in the country to um, give an executive order about biodiversity targets for Massachusetts. So her administration realizes the importance of that. So good for her. All right, this slide um, talks about our built environment, which, of course, affects our natural environment. So just thinking back over um, 50 years, we've had more building in town, more single family residences, and starting with Lincoln Woods um, in the early 70s, um, multifamily complexes of which there are quite a few now, Lincoln Woods, and then, I don't know the order exactly, but Farrah Pond, uh, Village, and then more recently, the Commons and, and Oriole Landing. Anytime there's a new building in town, it, takes, it probably takes woods, so it's taking a bit of natural landscape. Um, with, but we need, we need housing, we need, we need the buildings we have. Luckily, we have very wonderful wetland protection bylaws. So our, um, our swamps and streams are, are well protected. Um, and thanks to the creation of the Rural Land Foundation, um, we've been able to have a creative development, like clus some clusters. Starting the Wheeler Road, the Wheeler Road uh, development was the first that the RLF did in 1966. So have little well, houses closer, but then save some of the land around them for conservation. 40% um, of our land, actually 43 now, is preserved. And that is really such a treasure, which we've already heard about. And I just hope we can keep, keep at it and adding more, because that's how we're going to get biodiversity and healthy ecosystems. Um, there's more traffic. Nobody, everybody knows about that. Um, plenty of commuters going through Lincoln. Um, you can't go down a road during the growing season really without coming across landscaping equipment. Fifty years ago, you didn't see that. I guess, you know, we probably, people maybe did their own landscaping, or maybe you hired the kid, kid in the neighborhood to mow your lawn, and maybe people weren't, didn't have such standards of neatness. Anyway, lots of landscapers, and we have more noise pollution over these 50 years. Noise from cars, noise from planes, noise from leaf blowers. Sorry, that's one of my pet peeves. Um, <laughs> and um, 
Jeff has already mentioned light pollution. So um, Jeff's already touched on climate. We all know how much it's changing um, due to our burning of fossil fuels, warming the climate. I'll just give you a couple of examples um, of local global warming. So back when um, the Codman, when Codman was um, young, by the way, happy birthday to Codman Farms. They're 50 years old this year. Go Codman, yeah. <laughs> Um, so I use at the fair, which was usually the second or third weekend in September, I like to enter some vegetables in the vegetable competition. But I was worried back then, would there be a frost before I could harvest those vegetables? And sometimes there was. Well, so I keep records um, in my garden book about things like first frost. So. In uh, 2021, the first frost in my garden came on November 3rd, um, 2022, October 29. So that's just one example. Um, I talked to uh, Nan Bergen. She and Eve run a sugaring operation, as you probably know. Um, and Nan told me that they, she said, we never used to start sugaring until March. And there was normally still snow on the ground and the season lasted right into April. April. So now the sap starts to run as early as late January, and the season is over in the beginning of March. So that's just local effects of, of um, global warming. And of course, animals are affected by these changes too. We don't always know exactly how, but they certainly are. And for instance, I'm, I'm sure this past winter when we didn't have much snow cover, you know, the animals like the voles that need the protection, the insulation of snow. Also, some of the roots of my perennials, for that matter, um, missed out on that. We've had um, lots of severe storms. It seems like more wind storms. I walk through the woods and I see white pines that seem to have been snapped off like 20 feet up. Um, and then drought. So this, this slide, um, it, it speaks for itself. But if you remember, last summer we had a drought. So this, the pictures on the right are um, my lawn last summer and this summer. I could still be mowing for that matter. I, I wanted to mention the flowering crab tree in the upper right. That's, those are two, two of my trees. They're just beautiful. And the reason they're on this um, slide about climate change is because I wanted to give the example of, say, warblers that have migrated to Central or South America. Now, when they are coming north in the spring, what triggers them is the day length. So they start north when they feel that urge. Um, if they get to my flowering crabs, and it's been a really warm spring here, the flowers are over. So those birds don't have the, oh, the insects in the blossoms or maybe the nectar in the blossoms. So there's a mismatch. And a lot of people are doing phenology studies to sort of monitor the flowering of different plants. Just before I get to the specific plants and animals, I just wanted to talk a little bit about our overall landscape, which I think probably hasn't actually changed. Bird's eye view of Lincoln, I mean, I'm looking at Bryn's um, video there, it just, I think it probably hasn't changed that much in, um, in 50 years. Our ponds, our fields, our woods, looking down on them. Uh, our forests, though, are definitely more mature. They've grown a lot more. And we've lost some of our views. And I just think myself, I used to be able to drive down Conant Road and get views, glimpses of Valley Pond. No, no more. And um, Sarah Holden told me that when she was um, growing up in the house on Western Road, where she and Larry still live, um, she could see the cupola on the top of Center School from her house, uh, which we know is the town office building, no more. And um, Paul Brooks, one of the fathers of conservation in Lincoln, he and his wife Susie started out um, in the house where Rob and I live, I live now. Um, he said he could sit on my back lawn and he could see the white steeple of the first parish church, which um, 
It was just amazing to me. But actually, and there are tons of trees now blocking that view. The trees are not actually all, the, all that old. Now, longer growing season, because of warming, um, means that the trees have more time to grow, taking in more carbon dioxide. Now, the two slides um, on the bottom are exactly the same view. Um, this is also near my house, and um, Rakesh and Monica will recognize that, that view. It's the road you live on. So 1972, and now, unfortunately, I didn't have the same picture in the same season, but on the right, two weeks ago. And you can certainly see how much has grown. So my guess is that all of you can look around your properties and feel that things have grown, grown up a lot. All right, let's move on to ponds. We have a lot of ponds in Lincoln, and um, the tendency, especially of shallow ponds, is to grow in. The vegetation grows in, grows in. For instance, there used to be a skating pond on Silver Hill Road. Raise your hand if you remember that. Does anybody remember that? Well, a few people do. And I think we called it Long Pond. It was right next to the Silver Hill Bog. It's completely grown in there. Uh, Chris and Sue Clem in 1997 organized a pond study. I think it went on for two years, measuring a lot of things in many of our ponds. And so we haven't done that, redone that whole study to make comparisons, but some people uh, began to do a little work on that this summer. Um, Michelle Grisenda and Stacy Carter looked at a few ponds, including the Pierce Park ponds um, and Twin Pond. Um, this upper right, Pierce Park, you see it's, um, it's covered with duckweed. And I actually don't know why. I think duckweed responds to uh, fertilizer. So I don't know if that's the reason, because I don't really know if the fertilizer is used on the Pierce Park lawn. But anyway, lots of duckweed. However, I think the frogs are very happy there. The herons are happy. And Michelle told me that, that, that um, pretty soon there may be some request for CPA funds to do a little, um, I don't know what the word is, whether restructuring um, that pond and the other one right in front of, of Pierce House. Um, Farrer Pond, lower left, talked with Fred Winchell, who's lived there his whole life, and he told me that uh, Farrer Pond is about half as deep as it was when he was growing up. Uh, they've had some problems with an invasive um, water chestnut and cambomba, and he said that the mute swans, the Big white swans that you can see from 117 when you drive by Farrah Pond, they, they came about 10 years ago. This past winter, there were as many as 24, which was the most ever. Flint's Pond is our largest pond, and it's a kettle hole. It's very deep. Um, it's, it's, the water is clear, and I talked with Packy Lawler and Jane Layton about Flint's. And Flint's water is protected because there's no building allowed in the watershed. There are a few houses right on Sandy Pond Road, but no other building. And Jane was reminding me that um, the state required us to move trails back away from, from the water. And I believe de Cordova some years ago put up a fence um, to prevent people coming down the hill from the museum and going into the pond. Um, People used to be swimming and fishing in Flint's Pond, and the rangers had quite a, quite a job with that. But that has, that has decreased. Uh, loons have been seen on Flint's Pond and Walden Pond. And I have some friends who live within earshot of, of Flint's Pond and, and say they've heard loons at night. It may be one just going back and forth. I'm not, I'm not really sure, sure about that. Yeah. OK, um, Beaver Pond. Vin Durso has been visiting Beaver Pond a lot, observing the veg vegetation and the wildlife, and it seems like it's really holding its own. And, and Packy and his wife, who lived there, said that actually aerial photographs of Beaver Pond from the 1940s show about the same amount of open water. And here you can see um, vegetation, um, nice lilies, and there's some purple loosestrife up there and um, people, just neighbors, pulling water chestnut. All right, let's go on to our fields. We love our fields. Um, Lincoln has been a farming town for generations, and we only have to walk through the woods and see all the stone walls to know 
but there were a lot more fields because all those stone walls represent cleared land that was for grazing or, or crops. I think that there used to be more hay, haying in Lincoln. Now it seems to be maybe a little more oriented towards livestock. There are 19 farms that exist in Lincoln today. I guess they all have to be registered maybe with the conservation department. There are 13 leases on conservation land by farmers and then six others which must be private, privately held. And I'm always um, hoping that farmers will keep biodiversity in mind and keep the hedgerows along their fields because hedgerows are such a valuable habitat um, for all kinds of things, birds, small mammals, et cetera. Or leave the corn stubble, you know, if you grow corn so that the birds can come through and pick at it in, in the fall. Um, this picture, all right, you can see what they are. Um, this uh, picture lower right of Browning Field was a former hay field. And so it's a, there's an example of a field that's kept open. Um, the conservation department mows. Um, they try and wait till wait in the fall so that the fall flowers can finish blooming because there are lots of pollinators on those fall flowers. A lot of bed straw has moved into this field and other fields I have noticed. And you heard from Sarah about Chapman Pasture on the left. That used to be Betty Levin's sheep pasture and is now um, part of our whole pollinator project. So here are just some examples of livestock on our fields. Uh, chickens, pigs, I think these are, these are all codmen except the lower one. Um, pigs and um, cattle. And in the lower right, um, this is a little alpaca farm. All right, let's move on to flora. And we're gonna start with trees. So I'm afraid there's not, there's not a lot of good news about trees. A lot of our trees are actually in trouble. Um, I'll say one hopeful note is that the American Chestnut Foundation is hoping to bring back the American Chestnut, which was all over New England, you know, back until 1904 when the, um, the chestnut blight hit. The chestnut, American Chestnut is on our town seal and I think I'm right that um, the wood in the Donaldson Room town office building is chestnut wood that was saved. So we have two American chestnut nurseries in Lincoln, one on Flint's Fields and one on some land trust land on 117 near the umbrella parcel. Um, but, you know, it hasn't reached success yet, but that organization is working hard. Um, beech trees are being hit by a blight ash trees by the emerald ash borer, that's an insect, and lower left, that's what a lot of ash trees look like now, alas, they're dead. And then elm trees, elm, Dutch elm disease arrived about um, 1930 from Europe in a load of lumber, um, and it has killed 80 million trees across the United States. So this was a beautiful elm tree in Pierce Park. And it wasn't, I don't have a date on when it was cut down, the lower right picture. Um, I don't know if anybody here remembers. I'm guessing maybe in the 1990s or 2000, something like that. I don't know if there are any elm trees left in Lincoln. Anybody know? Are there any elm trees left in Lincoln? Yes? Ron says yes. Okay. Tell me later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's good. So hemlocks also have been hit by an insect called hemlock woolly adelgid, um, which is kind of hidden in this little frothy covering it makes. And um, I've, been to, I've been to places uh, a little bit further south where whole woods are just dead hemlock trees. That's the, t the nice big hemlock there is actually somebody's private lawn. So, I mean, in the woods, we still have hemlocks, um, and some of them are not hit by woolly adelgid. But um, anyway, when they have plenty of room, they look like that. Um, my brother, Joe Elkington, is an entomologist at UMass Amherst, and his, la his lab works on biocontrol of insects, and he says they're working on biocontrol for hemlock woolly adelgid. He also, I might say, his lab, I should say, his whole team, successfully conquered the winter moth do you remember that around Thanksgiving, we used to have hundreds of moths att 
coming to our windows or in the headlights of the car. Well, we don't have them anymore. And it's thanks to um, Joe and his team who came up with a little fly that was biological control. Now, there are all kinds of regulations you have to jump through. If you're going to come up with uh, a biological control, in other words, one insect to attack another, um, you have to make sure that the one that you're introducing to attack is not going to become its own problem. So, you know, don't worry. I mean, there, there are controls about that kind of thing. I don't think invasives applying to plants was even in my vocabulary till maybe 15 or 20 years ago. Never heard of it. Well, we hear about it a lot now. And I'm only just going to mention a few. Uh, this one on the right, um, I think, is one of the, the worst. Bittersweet, because bittersweet kills other trees. And it's very easy to pull out. It grows, grows all over the place. It has an orange root, so like with a lot of, a lot of things, if you get it young, you can deal, deal with it. And then up here, knotweed is also very, very aggressive. If you ever want to see what knotweed can look like, drive on Concord Avenue from Lexington towards Belmont. And there's a golf course on your left, and the right is just, just whole hedgerows of knotweed. Purple loosestrife, very beautiful. It used to, used to see a lot more of it. That, too, was successfully tamped down with a, with a beetle. And so now, it is, from my perspective, purple loosestrife is really, it's being kept in balance. And that's what you want. I mean, you're not going to get rid of all these plants, but if you can just keep some kind of balance, that's, that's what we want. Multiflora rose, yes, it's, you know, it's prickly and it grows a lot. Farmers don't like it, but I'd say just trim it back, but leave some of those hedges for the birds. Um, now, this one is a black swallowwort. That, I brought, I brought a show and tell. I brought some. And you can't really, see, well, I'll hold this up so you can see it. So, black swallowwort is in the milkweed family. And at this time of year, right now, I picked this yesterday, it has these pods that look like milkweed pods. And one of the problems is that monarch butterflies apparently sometimes lay their eggs on this plant because it's in the milkweed family. But then when the eggs hatch, the caterpillars will not eat those leaves. So the caterpillars starve. Anyway, it's, it's deep rooted. You gotta really pull to get it out. So I have a beady eye on my property for black swallowwort because across the road there's a hedge with, with a lot of it in there. This um, picture is of something called the Tree of Heaven, which is also known as Idlantis. And that's, this is a female tree. Um, and right now, this time of year, it's, they're laden with seeds. And one of the problems with uh, the Tree of Heaven is it's the preferred host of the spotted lanternfly. And the spotted lanternfly has done a lot of damage to trees and, and I think crops as well. In um, a little bit further south from us, in New York, in Connecticut, and so far it has been uh, found in five different towns in Massachusetts. The closest to us is Southboro. We're all supposed to watch for it and report spotted lantern fly if we see one. Here's what they look like on the right. Um, they lay kind of flat gray egg masses. And I could not resist showing you a cartoon from this, that was in this week's New Yorker. Um, these are spotted lantern flies watching a lecture. And I, I don't know if you can all read in the back, but the lecturer um, says, pointing at the screen, they're an invasive species that will destroy the environment if left unchecked. <laughs> yeah, right. Our old buddy, garlic mustard. So in 2009, uh, the Land Trust and the Conservation Department said, you know, we need to get to work and pull garlic mustard, and or began organizing a whole drive to do that in the spring. And it's actually made a difference. Can you raise your hand if you've ever participated in pulling garlic mustard? All right, look at that. Very good. It works. Yes, that's right. I mean, I notice around my house that the, the places that I have pulled a lot, they, they're not coming back. The problem is new places pop up. So you do have to watch, watch for that. All right, water chestnut. So there was a time 
when um, water chestnut actually covered almost all of Fairhaven Bay and the Sudbury River. When do you think that was, Jeff? 2000 or something like that? And so we rented, uh, along with Concord, a, a big harvesting machine to take care of the water chestnut. So now, that's really, there's not much there. Water chestnut appears in some other ponds. Here is a picture of uh, Beaver Pond uh, residents pulling it up just the canoe, in their canoe. All right, on to poison ivy. Poison ivy is a native plant. The berries, apparently, are quite uh, delicious for birds. It's a little hard to imagine making poison ivy jelly or anything like that. But <laughs> the chickadees are enjoying it. Just recently, Gabriella Emanuel, who reports for WBUR on health and science and happens to live up the road from me, um, did a piece on poison ivy. And she consulted, um, did some research with people who were working with the poison ivy. And apparently, um, the experiments show that poison ivy is uh, spreading faster, the leaves are bigger, it's more toxic, because there is more CO2 in the air. And I certainly see poison ivy everywhere in my neighborhood. It just seems to be really moving, moving fast. And as, as she said, leaves, leaves are bigger. I'm not testing the more toxic part. And other vines, too. I'm noticing Virginia creeper really spreading more. Um, and I just last week discovered on my property, um, what's it called, porcelain berry which is um, a vine coming up from the south. So I want to get on top of that. Apparently, that can strangle trees like bittersweet. Oh, yes, and more wild grape. I'm seeing more of all those things. All right, let's move on to fauna, which is probably what you really want to hear about tonight. Um, and I'm just uh, going to say, I'm not going to say anything about our small mammals, our squirrels, our rabbits, our voles, our chipmunks. I don't have any data about them. I feel as though they're still around. Um, and I, um, it seems like the squirrels, for instance, the population kind of goes up and down, sometimes in relation to whether we've had a good mast year, meaning a good mast, a lot of acorns. So for instance, there are a lot of acorns this fall. So we can expect these animals to do well um, as they you know, breed and so on for, for next year. Um, Raccoons, skunks, opossums, I don't know. I, I'd be interested to talk with some of you afterwards whether you think you're seeing fewer of those. I haven't seen a skunk myself in a long time. Or an opossum, actually. Bats. Now, bats, um, I read that they can eat a thousand insects in an hour. And Rob and I have loved for years sitting out on the back lawn and watching for just two or three bats, maybe at dusk. I've been in touch with um, a scientist who's been monitoring a long-standing bat colony in Lincoln, and he says that if we're just seeing a few bats like that, they're probably big brown bats. The colony that's been studied in Lincoln are all little brown bats, and this colony was studied even back in the 1940s um, from people at MIT. They were studying echolocation. So that colony is uh, still here, and um, it's done pretty, it, you know, died off a bit with a white nose syndrome, which hit bats all over the place. Um, but now it's, it's coming back. And um, so what the sci scientist was telling me was that the bats, they, they hibernate in the winter. So they, leave, they would leave Lincoln this, in the fall, and they go to caves, perhaps, in Vermont. Um, and they can pick up white nose syndrome again over the winter. But, and then they come back to, you know, to Lincoln and raise their young and so on. But they can get over white nose syndrome. They don't all just die from it. So I guess it's basically, basically good news. Bobcats. Oh, my goodness. I've had many more reports of bobcats in the past two years than ever before that. Now, you know, you sometimes wonder, is it because um, more people have trail cams and are catching bobcats? But I think it's not just that. I really think there are more bobcats. And because our woods are more mature, I have not personally seen a bobcat. And I'm very frustrated by that. I want to see, I want to see a bobcat. Here is a little video of a bobcat. 
See that short tail? Now, what really gets me about this is that this, I know right where this Carol Reedy, who couldn't be here tonight, took the video, and that's the stream that goes under Conant Road and uh, into Valley Pond. And so that bobcat, this, this was taken at about 5 p.m. traffic time, and that bobcat was walking maybe, I don't know, maybe across the road. And you see a house right, you know, right behind it. So I, I was just astonished that it was taken at, at that, able to be seen at that time. All right, um, fishers. So fishers, they, they are not fisher cats. They're not cats. They're in the weasel family, and they do not eat fish. And they, too, have become more plentiful over the past 50 years, also because our woods are more mature. They like woods. And I read that, I don't know how long ago, uh, fishers were imported to Maine because in Maine, um, porcupines were destroying a lot of crops. Fishers, I think, are the only animal that will eat porcupines. How do they do that? It's hard. <laughs> um, coyotes. So people I've talked to who have been, been in Lincoln longer than I have say that really they don't remember many coyotes around 50 years ago. And um, now there, there are a lot of coyotes. And I have a regular chorus um, across my road. Kind of creepy sounding, really. Here are two coyotes, and they are walking down the trail that goes from the commuter parking lot to Farm Meadow. Just la di da. <laughs> okay. Here come the otters. All right. So otters also have become more plentiful, and partly because the beavers have created more wetlands, so they're very playful. And I think, Ron, this is your video of otters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So that otter really likes having its picture taken. <laughs> See, I think it's an adult with some young behind it. Yeah. All right, let's talk about beavers for a minute. Um, beavers also, uh, they apparently had disappeared, you know, like 100 years ago or something. The beaver fur trade, they were trapped. Well, they've made a big comeback. And apparently you can still trap beavers, but you have to get a permit from the Board of Health or something. Is that true, Michelle? That and during trapping, well, trapping season you can, of course, but otherwise out of trapping season with the Board of Health emergency permit only if there's uh, deemed to be a health emergency. Okay. I don't know if you heard that, but needs to be a health emergency to get a permit to trap beavers. So beavers, I, you know, every time I look at a beaver and I look at these trees um, that they have chopped down, I try to imagine what would it be like to cut down a tree with my front teeth? <laughs> Obviously, beavers, you know, they're not busy. They don't have meetings to go to. They don't, they're not on a schedule. So they can chop away as long as they want. So we have a lot of beaver in Lincoln now. And here, this diagram shows their lodge. So they build dams to block up a flowing stream because they want to create a wetland. Um, and then they build separately a lodge where they live. And they live there in the winter. And so this diagram shows a cozy little room at the top. And so even if there's ice on the pond, they can get out below the ice, and they have stashed the branches that they've dropped the tree into the water, and so they have food to eat all winter. Now, somebody came up with something called a beaver deceiver. Great name. And so these dots on the map show where beaver deceivers are now located in Lincoln, some on conservation land, some on private land. And on the left, I think that's Mount Misery, for in Mount Misery. So the whole concept, you've probably seen things that look like cages in ponds. Well, the whole concept is that the beaver wants to make the dam, right? It cannot get into this cage because the cage is protecting a big uh, pipe, which is going to let the water continue to flow. So the beaver is happy making the dam, but actually it's not succeeding in, you know, damming it up in a, such a big way that, you know, there's, a, there's a, flooded, a flooded area. So we have quite a few of those around town, and it, se it seems to be working. All right, the next animal. Deer. I think everybody agrees we have too many white-tailed deer. And what does that mean, too many? Well, I mean, what are the, what's wrong with deer? The problem is, not only are they um, eating 
my vegetable garden, but they are, they're doing, they're really doing a lot of damage in our woods. So they are, they're eating the, um, the pl a lot of the plants that grow in the forest floor. So uh, they are really reducing the, um, the health of the forest ecosystem a lot. I talked to the, the deer biologist, he's, he's in, at Mass Wildlife Department in charge of deer and moose. And I, said, I asked him, sort of naively, I said, well, how many deer are there in Lincoln? Well, of course, he couldn't tell me how many deer there were in Lincoln because they don't do it that way. So they, they monitor, they have the state divided up in wildlife zones. So Lincoln is, is, we're in the eastern zone, which includes many towns from here all the way up to Cape Ann, not, not as far as Cape Cod, but probably, I don't know, 75 towns. And so what uh, Martin Feehan told me was that um, ideally, they think there should be a maximum of 18 deer per square mile. Um, and they estimate that in towns that allow hunting, um, that hunting on some conservation land, they estimate 24 to 40 deer per square mile. In towns where hunting is not allowed, like Lincoln, many more than that. Now, there is some hunting in Lincoln done with permit on private land, but, you know, we, we don't. So we're way over the number of deer. So what are we doing about it? Well, one project is uh, the Conservation Department is, is getting going on setting up some deer exclosures, and there are going to be eight of them. And a deer exclosure, as you can tell from the name, is really a fenced off area where the deer, the deer can't get in. And these areas will be monitored to see what, you know, over time, what grows there because the deer were not able to eat it and control areas also. So this is a, a training session getting going on setting up these deer exclosures. You might come across them in the woods. All right, next, of course, my favorite topic, birds. <laughs> Birds uh, that we no longer see in Lincoln. Uh, meadow larks, they need wide grasslands. I mean, they're, they're declining in many parts of the country. I actually, I should say before I even begin on any birds that um, there was a very um, troubling report recently, just uh, two years ago, that um, overall, there was a loss of three billion birds in North America since 1970. Three billion birds. Um, and more than 90% of the losses come from just 12 bird families, including sparrows, blackbirds, warblers, and finches. So, I mean, those of us who are birders, I think we, we are aware of the declining numbers for sure. All right, so these ones that we no longer see, um, Bob White, uh, ruffed grouse, ring-necked pheasant. How many of you remember a, a ringed pheasant in Lincoln? Yes, they made that kind of honking sound. Well, they were they ring-necked pheasant were originally from Asia. They were they were stocked for hunting, and um, they did not adapt well to our changing habitats. More woods. They really liked sort of early succession growth, um, brushy fields. So it got too wooded for them. I don't think they liked the suburbs. So we don't see them anymore. Uh, next, birds in declining numbers. So we still see these birds, but their numbers are declining. You know, I don't want to keep you, t I don't want to keep you till 11. Um, so I'm not going to talk about every one, but up at the top there, the yellow rumped warbler, just as an example of warblers. So birders look forward to the spring bird migration. These beautiful wood warblers, so colorful. Well, they still come, they still come. It's just they're not, the numbers are not there. Swallows, barn swallow, middle, bottom. They, swallows, are aerial insectivores. In other words, they eat, eat insects on the wing. And they are in, in decline, partly because there are fewer insects, and also not enough people leave their barn doors open for the barn swallows. <laughs> they do make quite a mess, I have to say. Um, I'm grateful to my next door neighbors who leave their barn door open. All right, next. This is an interesting group of birds. They, um, because of climate change, the warming climate, 
they have expanded their range northward over the years. Maybe some of you who've lived here a really long time might even remember the first time you saw a cardinal or a Carolina wren. They didn't used to be here in the winter. Um, probably the most recent um, in this bunch to arrive would be the um, red-bellied woodpecker. Don't ask me why it's called red belly when it has a red head. Um, I can tell you later. Um, it does have just a tiny little red belly there. And I'm wearing Carolina wren earrings in honor of this today. Um, so I will show you a graph and thank to Norm Levy uh, who made this graph, but he compiles all the data from the Christmas bird count for the Concord area every year. Thank you, Norm. It's a big, big job. So I don't know if you can see this very well, but what it's really telling us um, that both of these birds, the Carolina wren and the red-bellied woodpecker, they didn't even turn up at all until probably, I don't know what that looks like, maybe 1980 or something. And then the uh, red-bellied woodpecker is the lighter line. It's going up. The Carolina wren had a bad year. I would guess that was probably maybe 2015 or the next, the next count, 2016, because we had a really tough cold, cold winter, 2015, and they don't do well in, in bitter cold like that. All right, now let's move on to some po positive news. Birds which are more numerous now than 50 years ago. So um, upper left, that's a common raven. Used to be a bird of the wilderness, in my, in my book anyway. That common raven was caught in the act stealing a chicken egg from one of the Codman hens out, out in Codman North. And Norm Levy and I were leading a bird walk by Linden Tree, and we actually saw the ravens carrying eggs to their nest, which was somewhere down there, the stream below, below St. Anne's. Cooper's hawk, they come through my birding, bird feeding area much more than they ever used to. Uh, bald eagles, once DDT was banned, um, bald eagles have made a real comeback. And so they're pretty common now, both along the Sudbury River, uh, Cambridge Reservoir, and one, one year I remember, over several days, a bald eagle was sitting in the Cannon Holden field, dining on a delicious, rotting raccoon carcass. <laughs> um, and then lower left here, we have uh, pileated woodpeckers. They seem to be doing really well. I get reports from all over Lincoln of them. Bluebirds also doing well. And maybe that's because so many people put up birdhouses for them. Many bluebirds uh, spend the winter here. Some migrate south. And so I get them at my suet feeder all winter long. And they like mealworms, too. And on the right is a barred owl. They seem to be more nu numerous. That's the, who cooks for you, owl? All right, next, aha, uh -huh. wild turkeys. They are doing just fine. Uh, they are native. Uh, but the last native uh, turkey, they were, so they were plentiful in previous centuries when so much of our area was cleared for farmland, before all the woods began coming back. Uh, the last native uh, wild turkey was killed in Massachusetts in 1851. But in the 1970s, which isn't that long, well, it's 50 years ago, um, 37 were trapped in New York and released in the Berkshires. And look what's happened since then. So now it's estimated that there are between 30 and 35,000 uh, wild turkeys in Massachusetts. They are a game bird. So I will never forget the first time I saw turkeys roosting high in a tree. What? These big, ungainly looking birds, they actually roost high in trees. And then, uh, crossing the road. So one day I was driving on Trapelo Road and the, there was a backup of cars. Well, it was turkeys. The turkeys didn't care about the commuters. They were coming up to the, your window and pecking at the chrome on your door handles, things like that. So you've probably all had experiences like that. And here is another graph um, from the Christmas bird count, which shows the decline of the ring-necked pheasant and um, just about the time it was nearly gone, you can see the wild turkey in the lighter gray is, is really becoming much, much more abundant. Um, all right, goodbye birds, amphibians. 
I think we love our frogs. And you know what? When Jeff was talking here earlier, I could hear a spring peeper out this window. You can actually hear spring peepers any month of the year. We get the big chorus in the spring, but other months you can hear just one sound and you hear a beep, and I think, is that a bird? No, it's not, it's a frog. A picture I took, just, uh, oh, I don't know, a month ago. This little spring peeper, far from water, was stuck with its little sticky pads um, to the storm door, my back door. Amphibians are generally in decline. They're, uh, they're suffering around the world, I think. Um, but I don't have hard numbers. You know, we, we put up signs to protect the um, frogs and salamanders during the migration in the spring. Um, I'm usually out there, um, up on a crossing on Conant Road. And I would say I haven't seen as many in the past few years. But, you know, what does that mean? Maybe they cross at midnight when I've gone home. So um, I've talked with Rick Roth, who's um, director of the Vernal Pond team in Cape Ann, and he says they definitely are seeing decline in amphibians there, partly habitat loss, um, carnage on the roads. Sad, so many getting run over, but fewer egg masses too. So I don't really know, but I'm, I'm a little worried about our amphibians. Some people, when I was preparing for this talk, told me that they didn't think the spring peeper chorus was as loud as it used to be, um, I didn't think the wood frogs croaking near me really went on as long as usual. But see, this is all very soft. It's not real science. It's just impressions. That, so that's all I can tell you about that. And turtles. Um, we still have snapping turtles, painted turtles out sunning on, on logs in the pond. Um, Mary Rosenfeld did a, a study of of turtles and salamanders in 1997. And even then, some of the rarer salamanders like blue spotted and Jefferson's were definitely in decline. And turtles, I, I never see or hear reports of things like wood turtle or box turtle or musk turtle um, anymore. Uh, you won't really like the next slide. Um, ticks and jumping worms. So, um, you know, 50 years ago, there were dog ticks around, but we didn't have um, deer ticks. Nobody talked about Lyme disease. But now it's not just Lyme disease. Deer ticks carry some other diseases as well. Um, I'm, I'm just surprised that a vaccine for Lyme disease hasn't been developed. But I'm sure there must be good reasons, but it would be really wonderful to have that happen. I do not have much to say about jumping worms, except that they are a problem. And they are in the woods as well as our gardens. Um, and one thing they do is that they, they um, chew up, they destroy many of the nutrients in the soil. And there's no solution yet to jumping worms. I actually have a little bag of them in my freezer. <laughs> But that's not, much of a, that's not much of a solution. I must be careful not to pull it out and eat them. <laughs> um, so I know that, that people are working on, you know, what to do about jumping worms. The last group I'll talk about are insects. And this cartoon kind of says it all. Insects represent about 40% of all known living species of animals, 40%. So they are essential to our healthy ecosystems. They're crucial to the food chains. And as the cartoon shows us, you know, in the old days, we used to take a long trip and get all these insects plastered against the windshield. That does not happen anymore. I would say, I think that humans seem to have kind of a love-hate relationship with insects. Some people just don't like bugs. But um, they all have their place in our ecosystems. So here are a few. Um, I think everybody likes ladybugs. Everybody likes fireflies. And as Jeff already referenced, fireflies, they are they're in trouble too. I asked Sarah, Sarah Lewis, who used to live in Lincoln, is one of the world's es experts on fireflies. Um, I, I asked her, I said, Sarah, is it, do you think it's true to say that um, 
fireflies are in decline in Lincoln. And she said, well, yes, I think it's safe to say that. But she went on to compliment Lincoln for being so um, wonderful about saving conserve, conservation land. So we're much better than, she said, many other towns in, in our area. But we should try to keep the kind of brushy field habitat that they need and keep the dark skies. Um, now, this little thing down the lower left is the brown marimated stink bug. And I bet we will all be finding these in our houses quite soon because they come in, they're, they're searching for a warm place for the winter. And so I just, you know, pick them up and throw them out the window. Um, they probably come right back in. They actually do not do any damage in the house. They're not eating your clothes or your rugs or anything. Um, I think they can do some damage to crops. So here's just another view of a way to help insects. Um, and these are some of the beautiful pollinator gardens that the Land Trust is, has planted around town. But the pollinator, it's not just about saving the bee, the wild bees. It's, well, what do they do? I mean, it's part of the whole system. So because the, bee, the bees are actually helping the plants to produce something, what do they produce? Well, they produce seeds or fruit. And so then other animals eat those seeds, or those seeds get planted somewhere else. So we have to not just think about the one species, but think about the connections, how it all fits together. Um, everybody, I think, loves butterflies. And I read that there, there are several species of butterflies that are increasing. And two of those are the spicebush swallowtail and the tiger swallowtail. And on the right, uh, we have some beautiful slides of monarchs. Everybody loves monarchs. Uh, with the uh, caterpillar in the middle and uh, then the chrysalis. Uh, when it's first made here, very, very beautiful. It's just like a gem of nature. And then when it's about to hatch, it goes transparent. And I used to raise these in, in my science classroom, and I watched this whole process. It was just magic, magic. I was very lucky to go with, um, in a group led by Sarah Lewis and uh, several other people, um, including Nina, who's here tonight, um, to see the wintering monarch butterflies. This was this past January in the mountains of Mexico. So it was simply amazing to be in a place and see a whole woods, the, the kind of pine tree they have there, with all these branches just laden with thousands of monarch butterflies. And it's, it's hard to imagine that they could actually be in trouble. There's so many. Um, the overall um, numbers on monarchs are gradually going down, I'm sorry to say. But they do have ups and downs. This summer, there, um, there didn't seem to be that many around, just anecdotally. Though Nancy Soulette had one in her garden yesterday, so it's on, her, it, it's on the way. The, migra the migration of monarchs, how do they know? They've never made this trip, but they know just where to go. So, uh, so what can we do to promote biodiversity and healthy ecosystems? It, there's really two, two levels here. One is on the level of the groups like the Conservation Commission and Department and the Land Trust that are responsible for stewarding our big pieces of, of conservation land. You know, what's the best way to manage? Do we need to create different habitats? Um, what about trails? I mean, our trail use has greatly skyrocketed. Um, Lots more people, dogs and bikes on our trails. It's great to have people outdoors enjoying nature, but of course that impacts the ecosystems. Um, what about managing our forests? So that's one level, and the, but then we all go home and we can do something in our own backyards. And I hope you will take the little flyer that is on the table if you've lost yours, but here are just, just a few suggestions. Plant native plants. Um, maybe you've already per, um, participated in No Mow May last year. Um, let your lawn grow a little, li little higher. And um, leave the leaves. Rachel Neurath gave a great workshop last week about why you should not blow all the leaves away. Um, 
leave them. They, you know, use them as mulch and don't, don't make everything so tidy. Go wild. I mean, in England, they talk a lot about wilding the landscape. And I'm a big fan of that. Um, you know, I used to work in Wellesley, and I would commute from Wellesley, quite tidy, and then through Weston, also very tidy, and I'd cross into Lincoln. Ah, I'm home. It was just not quite so tidy. You know, a little more weedy, a little more natural. So that's my bias. But go wild. Thank you so much for coming tonight. So uh, thank you. Um, we have time for a couple questions or comments. I know it's late, so um, feel free to depart. But um, Gwen will answer a few questions um, if anyone has any. Maybe. <laughs> I, um, I actually was going to call you anyway with this question. I heard about the jumping worm, and I saw that you had it listed. But um, I didn't know if, if they had found it locally. And, um, I don't know yes, it's very much here locally. You know, pretty much everybody I know says they have jumping worms in their gardens. Who knows how they all got here? They may co have come through plants that we buy. You know, there's a lot of uh, nurseries may carry them unintentionally in, in potted plants. And yes, they're in, in the woods as well. I saw a partridge in the West Concord. Uh, we could go. Is that a common bird here? No, it's not. That's nice. Very nice. I know you just had a workshop on this, but if you leave your leaves, do you ride over them with, or do you, do you mow them with a mower so they break up? Because you, you get, you know, very thick covering of acidic oak leaves if you don't do something. Well, you can, you can, yes, you can mow them and, and chop them up and they will decompose faster. Uh, so coming from Maine, living in Maine, uh, I, I come in and hear this having grown up in Lincoln. Uh, but I, I, I see how, how similar what the, the issues that we're having, even in rural Maine, that are very, very similar to the things that you're seeing here in Lincoln. Um, it's lovely to see Lincoln continue to keep conservation lands. And uh, I think a lot of the changes that you're seeing probably are also uh, because of the impact of uh, the towns around, the, the development in towns around, um, as well as changes in Lincoln. Um, and we're seeing increasing pressures uh, that are maybe a few years behind, but we're seeing the same invasives, we're seeing the same uh, environmental shifts that you are uh, already. So. Anyway, I just wanted to add that. Thank you, Lily. Yeah. Great. Well, um, thank you again, all of you, for coming. Obviously, um, keep the wildlife sightings coming to Gwyn, and hopefully we'll then get another inspiring talk. Thanks again.